Um, but I, I think it's going to be a fun time for the ladies to kind of replace the cookie exchange that we would have otherwise been having. Um, today we've got the prayer walk here at church. We've got beautiful weather, a little chilly. Bring your jackets, your scarves, your whatever you need to warm up. Uh, 3 p.m. here at church. A great time to just come pray for the community, pray for the church. Uh, pray that we're the beacon of light to the community that God has called us to be. Um, we've also got some Bible studies that just started up on Wednesday night. There's two Bible studies um, at 6.30. Pastor Ron is doing a Bible study in the Fellowship Hall downstairs under, under the sanctuary. I believe that's available on Zoom as well. So if you're interested, please contact the church office to make sure we can get you that Zoom link. Um, that's going to be on the high priestly prayer that is found in John 17. And then also here in the sanctuary, Pastor Tom is uh, continuing the Bible study on the book of Acts. Uh, so that will be here in the sanctuary. Again, both of those are at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings. Um, we also coming up on Saturday, December 19th at 7 p.m., our evening of Christmas worship. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, kind of a new thing since we've got this whole new COVID thing we're trying to figure out. Um, we, we will be live streamed here on Facebook as well as limited seating because of the COVID. We do have to have limited seating. Uh, please see Pastor Tom or contact the church office if you're interested in attending in person. But to also consider that if you are able to live stream um, and, and we could potentially save seats for those since there are limited seating here at the church. Um, that's it for announcements for today. Uh, let's bow our heads in prayer before we continue in our service. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the snow. Some areas got snow, some not so much, but it reminds us of what you did so long ago as you washed us white with, white with snow, but it started with your coming as a baby. Thank you for that precious gift, Lord. Pray that you will be blessed in this service, that it will be pleasing to you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand together as we come before and go to worship. But before we do that, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Yeah, we can. If I can have uh, Amanda and Matthew and Luke come on up here. And as they are making their way up here and, and getting settled in, you can grab the microphone down there. And there's one of the, the, the lighters. And as we do each week of Advent, we light an Advent calendar, an uh, Advent wreath, uh, the wreath of the candle. And this week, we're lighting the second purple candle, which represents Bethlehem. It's known as the Bethlehem candle. And it gives us the idea of how Jesus came from such humble beginnings. And he entered into our life, really focusing on his God with us. So, uh, Luke, you are going to read uh, the scripture. He's going to read from Isaiah 40, 3 through 5 for us. I, Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. A voice is kind, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make some think in the desert a highway for our God. Let a valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain of broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the flesh will see it together, for the month of the Lord has spoken. Amen. Very nice, gentlemen. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, guys. Now turn it over to Dan, the worship team. Let's worship the Lord. Well, hey,
unspeakable joy. Lord, we thank you for the joy that you fill us with. Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have. Lord, we thank you that we can gather this morning not only to worship, but we also have a chance to celebrate the Lord's Supper in which we commemorate all that you've done and what you're going to be doing for us, Lord. So, Lord, we just lift up our hearts to you this morning. Open our hearts. Open our minds so that we can know you more. We can know you more fully in every way. We thank you for the hope. We thank you for your love. We give you all the glory. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. And you can be seated. As I said, we're going to celebrate the, the Lord's Supper today. So if you didn't have a chance when you came in, um, we have the fellowship cups here. We do the, do the Lord's Supper a little differently now. But the fact is, we're celebrating the Lord's Supper, who has never changed, who has never, ever turned from any of us. So it's, it's always just a, a day when we come together and we celebrate one of the two ordinances we have in the church. We have baptism and we have the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And it always is such a great moment of reflection as we can turn and we can remember all that Jesus did for us. His grace, His mercy, and His love. So how we celebrate the Lord's Supper for those who maybe haven't done so with us, or if you're watching online and this is your first time, we have our we have our fellowship cups which contain the bread and the juice, which represent the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. And what I will do first is I will pray over the bread, and then I will share from Scripture from 1 Corinthians 11. And then we will take the bread together in community, remembering our Lord's broken body. And then I will pray over the juice, again, which represents the blood. We'll share from Scripture. And then we will take and drink the juice as a community. So let's pray over the bread. Lord, as we take this bread, we understand that it represents your body. A body that you allow to be broken for us. Lord, that there was nothing that could that you allowed in the way to keep us from having our sin forgiven. You, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb, unblemished in every way, gave your body for us. So Lord, in a moment when we take this bread, let us reflect on the love that you have for us. The love that you showed for us. And Lord, and as we remember that, let us look ahead in confidence and know that you will return. Now I'll read from 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So now we take the bread. all of our iniquities. A blood 
that you shed freely for us, your people. So Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you gave us. Lord, we thank you for the eternal life that you have given us. And we thank you that one day we will stand in your presence. And as I read again from 1 Corinthians, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we drink the juice. for Children's Church. I always see that look of anticipation. We'll have to remember to dismiss us. Thank you for the worship team. And uh, correct a couple of technical difficulties after the first service. But uh, they did a very nice job, Dan Charlene, putting that in the drum, the bass drum pedal back together. Thank you for that, that added effort that goes along. As Bill mentioned in the announcements this week, um, today at 3 o'clock we'll be having our prayer walk. So I'm looking forward to that and a chance for us to pray for our church, pray for our community, pray for our world, pray for our country as we gather together in a time of self-directed prayer in which we walk around the property and uh, pray for the various things that the Holy Spirit opens your heart to pray for. It's, uh, it's always a good time. We've been doing this since September that we gather the first Sunday of every month to do this. And today it's at 3 o'clock. And really as we, as we pray and taking our, taking our prayers to the Lord, taking our hopes to the Lord, the hope of the world. That's been our our Advent sermon theme that we're that we're in. The hope of the world. Last week was the hope of his calling. And this week we're looking at the hope of the gospel. The hope that the gospel represents. What it means to us. How it shows us who God is and all that he has planned. So why don't we open in a word of prayer and then we'll get into our scripture. Lord, we thank you that you are the perfect hope. Lord, there are other places in the world where we could choose to put our hope. But Lord, let us not be focused on them today. Let us only be fo focused on you, the hope of the world, the hope that we see that is in the gospel, in the good news that was given to us, the hope of our first love. Lord, as we look at Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. Let us see the love that he has shown through the power of your Holy Spirit to the people in the church, Lord. Lord, people just like us who love Jesus. And Lord, and then as we look in Luke and we see the joy that Mary and Elizabeth have and the hope that is presented to them, Lord, let us just grasp onto that hope and put aside all the things that may at times distract us and focus on you. We thank you, Lord. We love and praise you. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. The hope of the gospel. And this, uh, again, is one of the four hopes that Paul talks about in, in his epistles. And I'm going to read to you from 1 Colossians 22 and 23. This is where we'll start. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, 
firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Paul really encapsulates there the hope that is in the gospel. And it leads us to very simply say, the main idea that we want to strive to take out of here today, to take from God's Word today as we reflect on all that is going on around us, is quite simple. Although at times we can get distracted. And the simplicity of the message is, Christ alone is our hope. And isn't that a simple message? But isn't that full of love and God's grace and just something that we need to grasp onto at this moment and so many other moments that maybe we've come through and that maybe we're going to come into? Christ alone is our hope. And maybe you're sitting, maybe you're watching, and you're saying, I know that. I know that Christ alone is our hope. I've learned that. I've been taught that. As Christians, we should know that. We have all the things that might be running through our heads. But yet it's in here in God's Word as a reminder to us. And it was written by Paul to the Colossians in about 61 AD. Only about 30 years after Christ had died and had risen. So it's only 30 years post-Christ walking on the earth alive with them, them seeing Him. And yet here is Paul, through the inspiration, the power of the Holy Spirit, having to say, hey, Christ alone is your hope. Now maybe start to think about this. Well, I know Christ alone is my hope. The people in Colossae, 30 years after Jesus, they knew Christ was their hope, but there were some things that were coming in, that were coming to the church, that were affecting God's people. And as Paul wrote this letter, and as Paul writes it to us and we hear it, this is not condemnation. This is not Paul just dropping a heavy hand. This is Paul saying, we just need the reminder some days that Christ is our hope, and that truly that news that we heard, that gospel, that good news, is where the hope is so revealed to us. And I think that the word that even comes to mind as Paul is writing this, and I enjoy words, I enjoy, uh, I'm still one of the few people maybe who own a thesaurus, an actual printed copy of a thesaurus that sits on my bookshelf, I see couple waves there, people nodding. Okay, that's good. But I enjoy thesaurus and looking at words. And really, as Paul is, is coming into this, and as we read what Paul wrote, we have to look at a word called, what's the backstory here, Paul? There's a backstory to this. Why are you just saying this? Is he just randomly saying this? Or is Paul addressing something that goes on in the word backstory? is really actually quite an interesting word. Because we hear it all the time now, don't we? You know, it's all the... No, you got to hear the back story. Hold on a minute. Sometimes it's said in a good way. Maybe our actions... Well, no, the reason I did it, you got to hear the back story. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, we can laugh. But what was interesting is when you look at that word, that word didn't enter really the English language, the dictionary, according to Webster's, until 1982. And I found that very interesting as I did to research words. So before 1982, there was no backstory. We didn't have anything to base on, but yet Paul is. And you see where I'm going with this. And that just gets me to one little aside as we look at the study of words. And if you think back to maybe where were you in 1982? What were you doing? At what point in life was that? But there were some other words that were introduced in 1982 as well. Long faster. How about email? Email didn't come into play until 1982. Imagine that. And then, of course, when email entered into our language, the word snail mail, that came along. 
And then also, I thought along those lines, I found another interesting one. Escape key, then enter into the dictionary. You know the key on the keyboard? When you hit that, because nothing else will work. Escape, alt, delete, you know. And then, um, if anybody's ever worked as a youth leader or gone to a Christian conference or a Christian con um, concert, this word never was used, but now it's used by our teams all the time. And youth leaders know because it's called merch. You've got to go to the merch table. You know, the, the teams ever say, I don't know where Jonathan is, but any of the other youth leaders are built. When you take, when you take the youth of the Christian concert, oh, we've got to go to the merch table. And the kids don't have any money to buy the merch, and guess who ends up footing the bill for that? Right, but merch, that's a, that's a word. I heard it last night mentioned in a, in a concert I was watching online with uh, Dave Pettigrew, a Christian concert. And then as we're in the, we're in the Christmas season, how about the word turducken? You know, it's a turkey with a duck and then a chicken inside, and you cook it all together. Those didn't exist in 1982, so maybe there's some good and bad there. And just as I was looking at the different words, I thought of um, Bob Steele. Remember Bob Steele? The great radio host, the word of the day. So the words that we use, well really we want to focus in on backstory. Because there was a backstory in which Paul was addressing here in Colossians. And I think, you know, even as we look at it, the word fits perfectly, and it get, kind of gives us the idea of the, the timelessness of the Bible. Because, oh, I know, I know that. God's word never changes. God's word is the same. God's word was good then, and in 61 AD, it's good now. But this is such a perfect reminder that we do have a backstory in all of our lives from where God has brought us to where we are now. And yet God's word remains timeless, in a sense of timelessness in his word. And as Paul wrote this text to the Colossians, these two verses about the hope of the gospel. It was very serious, but it was written in love. It was written, again, not to condemn, but to say, look, this is something that is happening. We need to take that step back. Remember what Christ did. Moving forward, because he talks about being holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Those are good things. And what he's saying if we are to remain holy, if we are to remain blameless, and if we are to be above reproach, we cannot be nonchalant about our responsibilities or to be fooled by other avenues that people say may exist to get to God. We have to be focused in. Now, he's not insinuated in any way that we would lose our salvation. Our salvation is guaranteed by the acts of Jesus Christ. When we accept Him, we turn to Him, we bring to Him the forgiveness of our sins, and we make Him the Lord of our life. But in that journey, in that sanctification journey, that journey from being saved to the day we're glorified, that can be a rocky road. And that's what Paul is dealing with here and that's what we want to look at today because exactly what Paul found is that people were missing out on the hope of the gospel, the hope of the good news, that simple fact that Christ alone is our hope. Paul was specifically dealing with something called the Colossian heresy. There was something going on that was infiltrating the Colossian church. That was actually the back story to him writing this letter. And the Colossian heresy was something that, is, that was and is still superficially attractive message with the goal of undermining the gospel. It's a superficially attractive message with the goal of undermining the gospel. The gospel is the good news. The gospel, the good news tells us there's one way and only one way to restore our relationship with God. There's only one true hope that we have to get to heaven. And His name is Jesus Christ. And we may say right here, Pastor, we don't have a Colossian heresy in our church. 
Okay, maybe we don't call it that. But I would challenge that every day in our lives, as we go out into the world, as we go out, as we're believers in Christ, or maybe we're seeking Christ, maybe we haven't made that step yet. If you're, if you're here and you're watching and you're listening, say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, there's something here, this Jesus, I want to seek Him and know Him. Well, we'd like to help you with that and let us know. But as we pursue our life with Christ, we come up against the heresy that's called humanism. And humanism has been around a long, long time, even as Paul addressed. And it's an ideal that human tradition is the best way to develop our values and our virtues. As opposed to God's Word, as opposed to the good news, as opposed to the Gospel, which is where Paul is saying, put your hope there. Because you're going to come up against some really hard things. We've been dealing with some really hard things in 2020. In our lives, in our families, in our jobs, in our schools, in our health care system, in our politics, in our church. Everything. There have been some challenges. And sometimes the, the superficially attractive way says, well, let's do it like the world does it. And that doesn't always go well. Our values, our virtues, we want to make sure are not developed from human tradition, but developed from the Word of God. Because, again, this isn't Paul condemning. Don't say, oh, boy, I made some decisions that were worldly. I'm a bad person. No, we're not... I don't want you to think that. We've got to have the hope and say, no, this is the warning that we have. This is Paul saying, no, look. Look, you remember the hope of the gospel? We're going to see in just a few minutes the hope that Mary and Elizabeth that was presented to them. And even Jesus warns about this as we look in, in Mark 7. And we see the words of Jesus. As he talks, Mark 7, 7 and 8, he warned, But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes who have gathered around him, but as Jesus always spoke, he was also speaking to those who were his followers. He's speaking to the Pharisees. The Sadducees, the scribes, he wanted them to hear the message of the gospel. That message that we have heard and we have placed in our hearts and that we place our hope in. That in, even in those moments when we deviate, when we follow a superficially, ooh, that looks a little bit easier, the love of Christ never changes. Because God is not based on our traditions, our thoughts, our feelings. God is based on His character. His unchanging, perfect character. And that's what Jesus was really pointing us to, saying we want to watch out for these and taking it as a warning given to us in love. A warning given to us full of hope. Saying the hope of the gospel, the hope of the good news, the hope of the salvation offered in Jesus Christ is where we place our hope. Because even as we go further, we look at Mark 4, 16 and 17. And we see as Jesus spoke in a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. So Jesus is saying we want to be the seed. We want to have the strong roots. The roots, the hope that is in our calling. We talked about last week, the calling that He gave us. And then the hope of that calling that is based on the gospel, the good news. And those hope, the hopes that we have are based on God's love for each of us. Not a superficially attractive love that can come and go. It's a foundational love built on the rock 
that never changes. And in 2020, I will, I would guarantee practically that all of us have needed to cling to that rock, cling to that truth of the gospel, which says, I love you. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I forgive you. I love you. I redeem you. That is where Paul is taking us. Because what he's saying is, the warning there is, when we release from our foundational hope, which is Christ, whom we came to know through the gospel, we will find ourselves ultimately dislodging ourselves from any hope. Saying, Don't follow that superficially easy, attractive way. Follow the only true hope. Because when all else fails, Jesus says, I don't fail. Does anybody need a hope this morning to cling to like that through some things that are going on in your lives? And I would encourage you to say, Lord, these things, I put some hope here. I'm really struggling with that. Lord, hear me. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Paul has really said in Colossians 1.22, he's talking about now, and then in verse 23 he moves into the future. And he is saying, Paul has stated in 1.22 that you are reconciled, you are holy, you are blameless. You can say that right now yourselves. Christ, because of who you are, I am holy, I am reconciled, and I am blameless. That's what we, many of us need to hear. We removed from the past of our sin problem. We had a problem. We were sinners, and there was no hope. Jesus said, I am the solution. When we were darkened in our understanding of God, excluded from the presence and the life of God, hard-hearted, due in some points to our ignorance. As Ephesians 4.18 says, we're saved. We look in Ephesians 4.18, we see all these things are gone. All these things are relieved by Jesus being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And then he goes on to say, in verse 23, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, created in righteousness and holiness. The good news is that we couldn't save ourselves but Jesus says, I saved you. That's where our hope goes. And even we see Paul, I mean, he loves to paint these pictures for us in, in Romans 5.10. For if while, you, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. See, Paul is not condemning here. He's saying you're holy, blameless, and reconciled by what Jesus did. And that hope is presented to us in the good news and the gospel. And that is the hope we cling to. Our hope is based on the love of God. And that's what we want to direct. Even as we look back for one moment on, in Colossians 123, where we start, he says, Indeed, if you continue in the faith firmly established. That is a warning from Paul. It's a warning based on love. Do not deviate from the gospel. Because Paul is saying, you're blameless, you're holy, and you're reconciled. Whatever happens, don't deviate from that gospel looking to the future. Because that future is yours. That future is ours. That future is where one day we will live in eternity with Christ because it's based on His love. Paul takes this and he says, 
Understand. Understand this morning that we, you and I, have gained a new relationship with Christ. That's what the gospel says. You and I have gained a new relationship with Christ. What an amazing gift. That's good news. He also says relationships cannot remain static. Now we talked about that last week. We said the hope of our calling, as we are seeing the hope of our calling, that's not static, it moves. Our calling in God moves. It continues to change. The hope of the good news, the hope of the gospel, we need that because our lives continue to change. And as we change and we grow more into the likeness of Christ, we need to know that hope of the gospel that we can grasp onto. Like in any relationship. Think of, think of the marriage relationship. When we're married, if that relationship just becomes static and stops growing and stagnant, we have a problem. And that's what Paul is saying. Your relationship with Christ is like that. Keep it moving. Keep it growing. Because we're here now. He's going to take us places and grow us. And then he warns the worldly ideals. They will corrupt our relationship with God. The Colossian heresy. The easy, superficial ideas that are out there. Flirting with other attractions. God's with a little g can endanger our relationship. And that is why Paul is saying, grasp on to the hope of the gospel. Paul is so good at, at writing these opposites out. Call it kind of a dichotomy. Maybe in our, in our vernacular we use the word polemic. You know, we, have one, we have one extreme or the other. And Paul really does paint this, a picture of extremes, opposites. Verse 22, he's talking about our relationship with God is established and steadfast. But when we lose our first love, when we drift from the hope, the opposite of that is you're moving away from the hope of the gospel. And we stay steadfast and established in God's word, in the good news. Then we don't move away from the true good news and the hope that lies ahead of us. So how does this relate to the Christmas story? You promised we would look at the Christmas story. Let's go to Luke. Let's look at Luke 1 and keep all these things about hope. The hope of the gospel. In our minds. I want you to go to Luke 1, 39 through 45. Mary visits Elizabeth. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me? that the mother of my Lord would come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Do you see this hope-filled encounter between Mary and between Elizabeth with the presence of the Holy Spirit there as the truth came to them. Remember back in, in, we look in Matthew 16, 16, we see Peter making the claim. We see Peter making the claim, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And oftentimes we think that's the very first statement of somebody saying, acknowledging Christ as Lord. That very first statement. No. It was right here as Elizabeth was the one who made the first statement. When she said, and how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Her Lord. Her Lord. Jesus. She is the one under the power of the Holy Spirit that came to realize and say, this is my hope. This will be my hope. 
Elizabeth makes the fir first claim that Jesus is Lord. She knew where her hope was. And as we see that, as I'll read in, I'll read in 1 Corinthians for you, because I, I think we want to see this scripture to fully understand what was going on right there. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had revealed to Elizabeth, had revealed to Mary, Jesus is Lord. Elizabeth came to know her hope. She came to know the hope in her life. The same hope that each of us can place our trust in. The good news was given to her through the power of the Holy Spirit, not through humanism, not through a superficially attractive message, not through worldly ideals, but through the living power of the Holy Spirit. And all that was going on at that moment, Elizabeth and Zacharias, they had some struggles. Mary and Joseph, there were struggles taking place there. How did this woman have a ch be with child? This wasn't going to be easy, but the Holy Spirit says, it's not the superficially attractive ways of the world. It is all about the hope of the gospel that Jesus is Lord. And do you see this when they realized and grasped onto that hope? And we read verse 142, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. The hope through the power of the Holy Spirit came to her. And she cried out as she grasped the hope. This morning, what is our reaction going to be to the hope that is right here? For all of us. The hope that we need. Not a superficial hope in something that may happen. Something that may occur. Something that might come my way. A hope that has already come your way. You see Mary and Elizabeth. Believed the hope. Before the plan was fulfilled. We can know the hope. Because the plan of God has been fulfilled in Jesus for us. Your plan, your hope, my hope has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you. Worship team can start making their way down. I want to encourage you this morning to think of that hope, to focus on that hope as the world comes hard against us right now. We are in a time of the year, Advent. We just celebrated the second week of Advent with the lighting of the Bethlehem candle. And as, and as Luke read that to us, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let us let our hope pave the way to look ahead, to look forward, just as we celebrated in the Lord's Supper, doing something in remembrance but looking forward and remembering the promise that Jesus made and the hope that we have. You know, we are in a spot right now as a world, as a people, as a church, as individuals, as families. We need hope to abound in every aspect of our life. Not a superficial hope, but a hope that is found in Jesus that is based on the rock. That we can be like the seed with the strong roots that are digging down into the dirt, that are clinging there, that a plant we're sprouting up, fruit is coming from us. Because it's based on the hope of the gospel, the hope that is in Jesus Christ. I, I would bet that this morning we have, if we had to honestly say, we come before the Lord and say, Lord, do I have any superficial attractions? that are pulling me and pulling my hope away from you. 
Do you have any this morning? You can say, Lord, yeah, there's been some things. The well, Lord, as we want to say, but we don't have the Colossian heresy. No, but we have our lives in front of us right now. And we have things that we're dealing with that we need to offer up to the Lord. That can free us. That can relieve us. That can take the pressure off. The pressure that may be overbearing. Oh man, there's some real, that's a lot easier path, Lord. Lord is saying, but I am your hope. He's always been your hope. He's never left you nor forsaken you. You know what I would encourage you this week? Read the Christmas story. Start in Luke. And read it. Share it with your family. Take a note card and write the word hope on it. Hope is in Jesus. Hope is in the truth that He loves you. Hope is in the truth that He's redeemed you. Hope is in the truth that one day we will spend eternity with Him. The Christmas story is the hope in the truth of, in the truth of the fact that Christ alone is our hope. The last scripture I'm going to read before we pray is in Isaiah 714. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. Let that be your hope. Not just this morning. Every day. Grasp that hope. And know that He is with us. The hope of the gospel is the hope of the world. He is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You that You are the hope that we need, the hope that we have, the hope that we want. Lord, let us push through all the superficial hopes, the values that the world is calling us to take, the virtues that the world says, this is how you must think. And know that you say, I am your hope. This is how you can think. This is what I've done for you. This is what I'm going to do. And I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lord Jesus, you are the hope of the world. You have redeemed us. You have revived us and you have renewed us. Lord, continue to do that in our lives so that we may bring you glory because you are the hope of the world. We love and praise you, Jesus. And in your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Amen. Stand and sing, church.